Hi, I'm James Green, and thank you for joining me again on Your Catholic Faith Today, where we've been reading the true story of Fatima. After being introduced to the three shepherd children, Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia, we have read about the first, second, and third apparitions of Our Lady. She stressed the importance of offering up sacrifices and saying the rosary every day. She then went on to warn what would happen to the world if it didn't change, and mentioned Pope Pius XI by name years before his reign. The important thing to keep in mind here is that a pope doesn't choose his name until his first day of papacy. So, this prophecy is yet another proof of the authenticity of Our Lady and the Fatima message. Before we go back to the story, though, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now back to the story. We left off with Jacinta's father, T. Marto, speaking with a powerful politician, the magistrate, about the children and what they had seen. The interview ended and they left for home. T. Marto thought he was through with the magistrate. It wasn't as easy as that. The magistrate had only begun the execution of his plans. It was almost time for the next apparition and this all-powerful official determined to prevent it at any cost. Monday morning, the 13th of August, T. Marta recalled. I had just begun hoeing my land when I was called home. As I entered the house, I saw a group of strangers standing there, but that no longer surprised me. What did surprise me was finding my wife in the kitchen looking so worried. She didn't say a word, only mentioned to me to go to the front room. Why the hurry? I said good and loud, but she kept waving me away. Still drying my hands, I went into the room, and who was there but the magistrate? So you are here, I said. Yes, of course. I want to see the miracle too. My heart warned me that something was wrong. Well, let's go, he said. I'll take the children with me in my carriage. As Thomas said, seeing is believing. He was uneasy and glanced about nervously. Haven't the children come yet? Time is passing. You had better call them. They don't have to be called. They know when they are supposed to bring back the sheep and get ready. The children arrived almost at once, and the magistrate began urging them to go in his carriage. The children kept insisting that it was not necessary. It's much better, he repeated, for we'll get there faster, and no one will bother us on the way. You all go to Fatima, he capitulated, and stop at the rectory because I want to ask the children a few questions. As soon as we got to the rectory, he shouted to us from the balcony, Send up the first. The first? Which one? I snapped right back. I was upset by the premonition of some evil. Lucia, he said arrogantly. Go ahead, Lucia, I said to her. T. Marta would remember this day well. The pastor was waiting in his office. He had changed his mind towards the apparitions. Now, he considered them not the work of the devil, but plain inventions. He would call Lucia to task, making sure that the magistrate would realize he had no responsibility in these events. Who taught you to say the things that you're going about saying? The lady whom I saw at the Covadiera. Anyone who goes around spreading such wicked lies as the lies you tell will be judged and will go to hell if they are not true. More and more people are being deceived by you. If one who lies goes to hell, answered the little girl, then I will not go to hell, for I don't lie and I tell only what I have seen and what the lady has said to me. And as for the crowd that goes there, they go only because they want to. We don't call anyone. Is it true that the lady has confided a secret to you? Yes, but I can't tell it. But if your reverence, reverence wants to know it, I shall ask the lady, and if she gives me permission, I will tell you. The magistrate cut in his in his plans, cut in as his plans would be spoiled if Lucia 
was allowed to return to the Koba to ask permission to tell the pastor the secret. But those are supernatural matters, he said with finality. The whole thing was a hoax and sheer treachery on the magistrate's part, T. Marto continued. When it came time for the children to go in, he said, That's enough. You may go, or better, let's all go for the sake of it's getting late. The children started down the stairs. Meanwhile, the carriage was brought right up to the last step without my noticing it. Senor Marto reported, It was just perfect for him, for in a moment he decoyed the children into it. Francisco sat in front and the two girls in back. It was a cinch. The horse started trotting in the direction of the Cobadiera. I relaxed. Upon reaching the road, the horse wheeled around, the whip cracking over him, and he bolted away like a flash. It was all so well planned and so well carried out, nothing could be done now. In the carriage, Lucia Luci spoke up first, though timidly. This is not the way to the Cobadiera. The magistrate tried to make the children believe that he was taking them first to see the pastor of the church at Orem to consult with him. As they rode away, the people along the road realized that he was stealing the children and stoned him. Immediately, he covered them with a robe. When he reached his house, gloating over his success, he grabbed the children out of the carriage, pushed them inside, and locked them in a room. You won't leave this room until you tell me the secret. He warned them. They did not answer him a word. If they kill us, Jacinta consoled the other two when they were alone, it doesn't matter. We'll go straight to heaven. Instead of an execution or with an axe in hand, the wife of the magistrate came and proved herself very kind to the three children. She took them from the room, gave them a good lunch, and let them play with her children. She also gave them pictures, uh, picture books to look at. Meanwhile, rumors had spread through the village that the devil would appear this time at Cobadiera to cause the earth to open up and swallow all those who were there. In spite of this rumor, however, many persons traveled to the holy spot. Maria de Cabalina was among them. She gives an eyewitness account of what went on. I was not afraid. I knew there was nothing evil about my apparitions, because if there were, the people would not be praying at the Kova. My constant prayer as I walked along was, May Our Lady guide me according to God's holy will. The crowd at the Kova on August 13th was even larger than in July. About 11 o'clock, Lucia's sister, Maria dos Anjos, came with some candles to light to Our Lady. The people prayed and sang religious hymns around the home oak. The absence of the children made them very restless. When it became known that the magistrate had kidnapped them, a terrible resentment went through the crowd. There is no telling what it might have turned into had it not thundered just then. Some thought the thunder came from the road. Others thought it that it came from the home oak. But it seemed to me that it came from a distance. It frightened us all and many began to cry fearing that they were going to be killed. Of course, no one was killed. Right after the thunder came, a flash, and immediately we all noticed a little cloud, very white, beautiful and bright, that came and stayed over the home oak. It stayed a few minutes, then rose towards the heavens when it disappeared. Looking about, we noticed a strange sight that we had already seen and would see again. Everyone's face glowed rose, red, blue, all colors of the rainbow. The trees seemed to have no branches or leaves, but were all covered with flowers. Every leaf was a flower. The ground was in little squares, each one a different color. Our clothes seemed to be transformed also into the colors of the rainbow. The two vigil lanterns hanging from the ark over the holy spot appeared to be of gold. When the signs disappeared, the people seemed to realize that Our Lady had come and, not finding the children, had returned to heaven. They felt that Our Lady was disappointed, and hence they were exceedingly upset. Resentment grew in their hearts. They started towards the village, clamoring against the magistrate, the pastor and anyone they thought might have anything to do with the arrest of the children. 
Everything had been so beautiful, but the sense of frustration at not having the children for the apparition made the people seethe with anger and roar out. Let's go to Oram to protest. Let's go and drench everything with blood. We'll get a hold of the pastor, for he is just as guilty. And the regidor, we'll settle accounts with him. T. Marto, meanwhile, had gone to the Covadiera. And when the shouting of the people grew louder and louder, though he considered both the pastor and magistrate guilty, he felt inspired to intervene in the tumult. Be calm, men. Be calm. He shouted with all his might. Don't hurt anyone. Whoever deserves punishment will get it. All this is by the power of the one above. Indeed, the one above also intervened to preserve for his mother the name of Fatima forever gracious and unstained, as is evidenced by the letter which the pastor wrote the following day for the newspapers. It was published a few days later. The rumor that I was an accomplice to the sudden kidnapping of the children I repel as an unjust and insidious calamity. The magistrate did not confide the secret of his intentions to me. And if it was providential, for such it was, that the authority succeeded in taking the children away furtively and without resistance, no less providential was the calming of the spirits, excited by this devilish rumor. For otherwise, the parish would have been mourning her pastor today. Certainly, it was through the Virgin Mary that this snare of the devil did not strike him dead. The authority wanted the children to reveal a secret that they have told to no one. Thousands of witnesses say that the children were not necessary for the Queen of the Angels to manifest her power. They themselves will testify to the ex extraordinary occurrences which have now so deeply rooted their belief. The Virgin Mother does not need the presence of the pastor to show her kindness. And this itself should explain my absence and apparent indifference regarding a case so marvelous and sublime. The children spent the night of the 13th in loneliness and prayer, beseeching Our Lady that they might have the strength to remain faithful to her always. When morning arrived, however, they were all taken to County House, where they were put through relentless questioning. The first to quiz them was an old lady who used all her cunning and wiles to learn their secrets. Later, the magistrate tried bribes, offering them shiny gold coins. He made all kinds of promises to them and threatened them with every sort of punishment, but the children would not give in. This kept up all morning, broken only by lunch. They were put through the same inhumane third degree all afternoon. Finally, the magistrate told them that he was going to put them in jail and have them thrown into a tank of boiling oil. We have to remember that we're talking about three little kids here, too. So it's amazing what they went through, and they stayed strong. When they reached the jail, poor little Jacinta began to cry her eyes out. Lucia and Francisco tried to comfort her. Why do you cry, Jacinta? Lucia said. Because we are going to die without ever again seeing our parents. None of them have come to see us, neither yours nor mine. They don't care for us anymore. I want to see my mother, at least. Don't cry, Jacinta. Francisco interrupted. We are offering these sacrifices for sinners. Then the three raised their hands towards heaven, repeating together, My Jesus, all this is for, for love of you and for sinners. And for the Holy Father, Jacinta put in, not wishing to forget any request of Our Lady, and in reparation for the offenses against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. There were many men in prison in the jail at the same time, and not one of them, no matter how hardened a criminal he might have been, could remain unmoved at the sight of the three little children. Each of the men took his turn trying to console the children or to shake them from their purpose of retaining the secret. Why don't you tell it to him? Why should you care? Never, Jacinta said. We would rather die. The children did not seem to mind in the least their being imprisoned in jail, but seven-year-old Jacinta could not accustom herself to the thought of dying without first seeing her mother. To distract her, the prisoners began singing, playing the accordion and dancing. They tried to get the children to dance with them, and one very tall man picked up Jacinta in his arms and danced around with her. The thought of Our Lady flashed through her mind. Dancing was not 
the right preparation for heaven. So Jacinta made the man stop. She took the medal from around her neck, asked the man to hang it from a nail on the wall. Then she knelt with Francisco and Lucia to say the rosary. Embarrassed and ashamed, the prisoners also got on their knees. One man still kept his hat on. Francisco got up, went over to him, and said, When we pray, we take our hats off. The man took it off and dropped it on the floor. Francisco picked it up and laid it on the bench. Soon they heard steps outside. A guard entered, looking at the children. He barked, Come with me. Again they were taken to the county house and put through the third degree. Jacinta was called first. The oil is already burning. Tell the secret. Otherwise, Jacinta, like our Lord before the judges, remained silent. Take her away and throw her into the tank, yelled the Inquisitor. The guard grabbed her arm, swung her around, and locked her in another room. Outside the magistrate's office, while waiting their turn, Francisco confided to Lucia, If they kill us, we shall soon be in heaven. Nothing else counts. I hope that Jacinta does not get scared. I should say a Hail Mary for her. He took off his cap and said a prayer. The guard, watching the children, was puzzled at the boy's behavior. What are you saying, he demanded. I am saying one Hail Mary for Jacinta, to give her courage. The other guard came back and led Francisco into the magistrate's office. Grabbing hold of the boy, he shouted, Spit out the secret. The other one is already burned up. Now it's your turn. Go ahead, out with it. I can't, he replied, looking calmly into the eyes of his new Nero. I can't tell it to anyone. You say you can't. That's your business. Take him away. He'll share his sister's lot. The boy was taken into the next room, where he found Jacinta safe and happy. Lucia was convinced that they had been killed, and thinking that she was next to be thrown into the burning cauldron of oil, she tr trusted in her heavenly mother not to desert her, but to give her courage to be loyal and courageous, even and, as Francisco and Jacinta were. Though Lucia did tell the magistrate something of what happened in the visions, even as she had told her parents and the pastor, she kept the secret part to herself. It was a solemn promise to Our Lady, and she would rather die than break it. The magistrate was not satisfied with this little bit. He wanted to know the secret. After her inquisition, Lucia too was locked in the room where the other two were, and how happy they were for their unwavering fidelity to Our Lady. <clears throat> the magistrate did not give, yet give up. The guard came in to remind them that soon they would be thrown into the burning oil. They thought of being able to die together for Our Lady, and, made, and it made them all the happier. The magistrate finally admitted, after further fruitless questioning, that he could accomplish nothing. Then, out of fear of what the enraged people might do, he himself took, took them in his carriage to Fatima, hardly realizing that the church was celebrating on that day the Feast of the Assumption. When the people filed out of the church, after attending Mass on the Holy Day, they congregated in the yard. The one topic on all lips was what had happened to the children. As Timarto came out, they all asked, Where are the children? How do I know, he replied. Maybe they took them to Centarum, the capital. The day they kidnapped them, my stepson Antonio <clears throat> went with some other boys to Aram, and he saw the children playing in the veranda of the magistrate's house. That's the last news I had heard. He had hardly said these words when Swoman shouted, Look, Timarto, look, the children are on the rectory balcony. Timarto recalls his feelings. I can't say how quickly I got there and swept Jacinta into my arms. I couldn't say a word. Tears ran down my face, wetting the child's face. Francisco and Lucia both threw their arms around me, saying, Father, your blessing. Uncle, your breath blessing as the custom is in Portugal when children return home after an absence. A public official and underling of the magistrate approached me. He shook from head to foot. I never saw the like before. Here you have the children, he said. I wanted to speak my mind, but I restrained myself and remarked, this might have come to a sorry end. They wanted the children to contradict themselves, but they failed. Even if they succeeded, I would always say they spoke the truth. The people in the churchyard were in an uproar, shaking their fists, swinging their staffs. 
Everyone was restless. The pastor left the church immediately and started up the stairs into the rectory. Suspecting that T. Marto was stirring the people against him, he said in rebuke, Senor Manuel, you scandalize me. I knew how to answer him then, recalls T. Marto, and the pastor went into the house. T. Marto could not at the time realize the noble role the pastor was playing that day. T. Marto then turned to the crowd in the yard and, still holding his little Jacinta in his arms, he shouted, Boys, behave yourselves. Some of you are shouting against the senor prior, others against the administrator, and still some against the regidor. No one is to blame. The blame lies with the lack of faith and all has been allowed by the one above. The pastor heard this and was very pleased. So, he said from his window, Senor Manuel speaks very well. He speaks very well. The magistrate had gone to the inn, and when he returned, seeing the crowd and T. Marto on the balcony of the rectory, he shouted at him, Stop that, Senor Marto. All right, all right, there's nothing wrong. The magistrate then went into the pastor's office and called T. Marto in. The rage of the people had subsided. The generous pastor was allowing the people to believe that he had shared in the abduction of the children in order to save the magistrate. The prudent words of a man of faith had the power to keep the crowd below under control. It was a fine proof of the power of religion. And pastor did not miss his, op his chance to point out the this fact to the magistrate. You must realize, senor administrator, that religion is a necessity, a necess a necessity also. As T. Marto was leaving, the magistrate turned to him, saying, Senor Marto, come and have a glass of wine with me. Don't bother now, thanks. However, he noticed a group of young men on the street, armed with staffs. It made him fear that they might clash with the magistrate. It was better that everything end in peace. So he stood up at the magistrate's side, thinking within himself that it might be the wise thing to accept his invitation. I am grateful, the magistrate said, realizing what he was doing. He felt safe. You asked the children if I did not treat them right. All right, all right, there's no hard feelings. The people think more of asking questions than I do. Just then, the children came down the stairs and headed for the Covadiera without losing a moment. The people began to go home, and the magistrate and T. Marto went to an inn. Of their conversations over the wine, T. Marto later recalled, The whole thing bored me very much, for he was trying to convince me that the children had told him the secret. Very well, very well, I said. They did not tell it to their father or mother, but they did tell it to you? With that, the matter ended for the time being. It is important to note, however, that the interrogation of the children served one purpose that was providential. Since everything became a matter of official record, the magistrate unwittingly made the existence of a secret revelation undeniable. On the following Sunday, the 19th of August, the children, according to their custom, went to Covadiera after Mass. There, they said the rosary, then returned to Adestrel, after lunch, Lucia, together with Francisco and his elder brother John, left for a place called Valinos, not far away, where they intended to spend the afternoon. The afternoon passed quickly, but towards four o'clock, Lucia became aware of the signs that always immediately preceded the apparitions of Our Lady. The sudden cooling of the air, the paling of the sun, and the typical flash. The children had begun, already begun having a wonderful premonition that they were to experience the supernatural again. Now Our Lady was about to come, and Jacinta was not there. Lucia called out to John, Go quickly and get Jacinta. Our Lady is coming. The boy did not want to go. He too wanted to see Our Lady. Go fast, Lucia insisted, and I will give you four pennies if you bring Jacinta back with you. Here's two now, and I'll keep the other two for you until you return. John took the pennies and started running home. When he reached his house, he called in, Mother, Mother, Lucia wants Jacinta. Aren't the three of you 
enough for your games? Can't you leave her alone for a minute? The mother answered back. Let her, let her come, little mother. They want her there now. See, Lucia gave me two pennies to make sure I would bring them. I would bring her. Two pennies? That was a lot of money for little children to give away so easily. What does she want to send for now? John, wriggling like a eel, burst out, because Lucia has already seen the signs in the skies, and she wants Jacinta there in a hurry. <clears throat> God be with you. Jacinta is at her grandmother's house. John bolted off to get her. There, he whispered the news to Jacinta, and together, hand in hand, they raced over to Valinos, so as not to miss Our Lady. Just as John and Jacinta reached the field, a second flash rent through the air. A few moments later, the brilliant lady appeared over a home oak, a slightly taller one than that of the Covadiera. The lady was re rewarding their children with their, of their fidelity. What do you want of me? Lucy asked. Lucy asked. I want you to continue to come to the Covadiera on the 13th and to continue to say the rosary every day. Lucia then told her lady of her anguish at the unbelief of so many in the reality of her presence. She asked her lady if she would be willing to perform a miracle so that all might see and believe. Yes, our lady answered, in the last month in October, I shall perform a miracle so that all may believe in my apparitions. If they had not taken you to the village, the miracle would have been much greater. St. Joseph will come with the baby Jesus to give peace to our world. That's all the time we have for today. We learned about the children being kidnapped by the magistrate and being threatened to be boiled in oil, the fourth apparition of Our Lady, and her promise of a miracle to come that will make all believe in her apparitions. Thank you for joining me, and please tune in again next time on Your Catholic Faith Today. I'm James Green. God bless.